Um, Ian says, loved your piece on Sri Lanka and their fall off the proverbial cliff post-2014. It's also, see, it's also great to see them coming back. Uh, how far are they from winning another white ball global tournament, be that T20 or ODI? I think they're a long way away from an ODI uh, win uh, at the moment. T20, I mean, T20 is more random. We saw that with Australia's win in the last World Cup. Um, you know, you can, it'd be really interesting to see how Australia's form holds up in this World Cup now that it's at home. Uh, I think they're almost a better team now than they were when they won that, won that last World Cup and they may not win this one. So it is a little bit more random. I can't see Sri Lanka in the top four teams on talent or experience or, or reliability right at the moment. What I would say is this, you probably only need to be in the best six teams and get a decent matchup, decent toss, um, decent run of luck in the semifinal and you're in the final, right? It's, that's how these T20 tournaments go. I would assume based on the fact that half their fast bowlers seem to be injured. Um, they don't have a lot of guys who can score at a decent rate. Um, and that maybe uh, they don't, they have a couple of guys in that. They don't really have that sort of power finishing uh, players in the middle, unless they're top order, um, uh, you know, a firing. I kind of think that they shouldn't be in the semifinals, but I also don't think they're that far away. So uh, I think the bookies have Australia and England as Australia is just slight favourites ahead of England. I think Australia's around three to one. England's about three and a half to one. I think India's about four to one. Pakistan's just behind that, and then you've got South Africa. Sri Lanka's a way back from there, and New Zealand's probably between South Africa and um, uh, in, um, uh, South Africa and Sri Lanka, right? So based on that, you'd have to say that. I don't think the bookies are massively wrong. You can disagree with you know uh, them on finer points, but if they've won about fifty percent of their games coming into this tournament. They look like a team set up better for Asian conditions at the moment. And even if they're not, we don't know what fast bowlers are going to be fit. I think is it one of the is it Kumara who hasn't bowled? Um, they've got the young left arm quick um, who I think is quite interesting. But first World Cup. I don't know how long that's going to hold, you know, that form or, or his skill set is going to hold up all the way through the tournament. Um, so there's certainly big questions, I think, over the Sri Lankan team um, uh, in that perspective. However, you do look at, you know, Hasaranga, Tikshana, Rajapaksa is still genuinely young. I think you've got another, you've got the next four or five years, they should be developing in their home leagues. They're already getting picked up in the IPL a lot more. So that would help them. It's possible that in two years' time, if they continue to develop as they have over the last 18 months, that they are a legitimate top four, top five team heading into a World Cup. That doesn't mean they won't make the top four this time just because of how the tournaments work. But I think that there's a difference between them being a very consistent team and heading into the World Cup and everyone thinking they're a really good chance and where they are at the moment. But there's a lot of good signs with Sri Lankan cricket at the moment. I mean, that said, they're probably overdue a captaincy and a coaching change <laughs> um, any minute now. Um, not to mention, you know, the SLC stuff and, and, and everything else. And um, I think their, their two next big problems are going to be when the IPL owners start to buy players for all the leagues in the world. And then specifically for Sri Lanka, I think because of the amount of money they played, the major league cricket in the US. Um you know, I heard a story that Roger Paxo was very close. He retired from Sri Lankan cricket before he made his comeback um, and almost went over there and played. Uh, I think that that would be the problem. Uh, I think they might miss – they may not miss stars. But they may miss players between that sort of 8 to 12 to 15 range. You know, someone like Dan and Jay De Silva, if he was offered a 200 grand contract to go and play in uh, in Major League Cricket at the moment – he probably doesn't take it right now, but does he take it in a year? Does he take? And it's those kinds of players that build out the back end of your roster for a World Cup campaign. And I and I think that plus a couple of top end players, you know, ending up in the uh, whatever we're going to call it, what are we going to like the the IPL worldwide franchise system uh, might cause them some problems. Uh, but great question. Prasant says, uh, "What would you say about talent management in the sport? Someone like Shimron Hetmyer should not be missing the World Cup." And I don't think he's even the first case in the sport. Well, he's probably not even the first case in the West Indies. Um, 
Um, uh, you've spoken about how Simons was not handled well by Cricket Australia. Yep. After a point, how much is it on the player and how much is it on the board's team's coaching structures? Um, yeah, okay. So the first thing is that it, it is the board slash team's responsibility to get the best players out on the field. They're, so you only, in international sport, it's not like franchise sport where, you know, you can move on and sign the next player or you can trade away your staff for three really great role players, whatever. You really have to be able to get the most out of your team as it currently stands. And I don't think having worked in and around cricket for a very long time now, that is the case. I don't think that teams really think about how best to get out of each individual player, how to build really strong relationships, how different players need to be treated in a separate way. So the perfect example is Golden State Warriors this week. You know, with the Draymond Green situation, he punches his teammate Jordan Poole in the face and he's not even suspended. Now, I think we can all say he should have been suspended. But he's not suspended because Golden State Warriors feel that that is a huge problem. But we also all know... um, that if that was a player who was the 12th or 13th most person important person on the roster, uh, they would be suspended and probably fired from the, from the entire franchise. That is what professional sport is, right, at, at this point. It is, it is working out those situations and, and, you know, whether Golden State did the right thing or the wrong thing, you have to make those sorts of decisions. Shimron Hetmeyer is not the same as Shamar Brooks, right? Shamar Brooks is spends basically all of his time getting ready to be as good as he can so he can get a good CPL contract and play for the West Indies. He's probably hoping that by playing well in the last CPL, he'll be able to get other um, franchise contracts outside of the CPL. Chibron Hetmeyer's main employer is not West Indies cricket. They are not the same. You know, you can't treat Kevin Peterson and James Taylor the same way. All these players need to be treated differently. And also, they're completely different human beings. And I think that Within sport itself, that is not always the best way. I don't think. I think coaching has been too team based and not do, do, uh, dealing with individual people, especially problem people like Shimron Hetmeyer and uh, you know Andrew Simons, who do need different kinds of management. Jesse Ryder, right? We've got plenty of them in our sport. Um, even Jimmy Anderson needs to be treated differently than than other than Jofra Archer does, right? And I do think that in cricket. That has been, and, and because cricket is more individualistic um, than others, I do think that we haven't quite come to the point where we've done that. I think at the end of the day, a player has to be fully um, uh, has to be fully responsible for their actions. But we also have to understand that some of these players are 22, 23, 24, 25. They're still developing as human beings, um, and they're developing as human beings where every decision they make can make front page news somewhere, right? Where everyone will discuss these things on social media. They are living a different kind of life than the people quite often who are making decisions about them. And the people who run the teams and the boards, these are usually people who are 35, 40, 45, who have rich professional backgrounds, uh, you know, who have management positions, who go on seminars and do all this sort of stuff. So it's fine to be able to say to Shimron Hetmeyer, you should be held accountable. But we should also be held accountable everyone involved, right? There is clearly a schism at the moment between Shimron Hetmeyer and West Indies cricket. The plain thing is just the, the, the tip of the iceberg because he wasn't playing for them before. There's clearly an issue with his wife and West Indies cricket, whether she thinks he should be playing, and I have no idea what, what this issue is, but whether she thinks he should be playing for the people who pay him the most money or whether she's felt slighted by West Indies cricket before. Whatever, the, and, and Shimron Hetmeyer may feel the exact same thing. In fact, maybe Shimron Hetmeyer, and he may just be, you know, not letting his wife take the blame, but, you know, that the rumour mill does what the rumour bill does at a certain point, right? Whether it's him or his wife, at a certain point, Shimron Hetmeyer is not focusing on West Indies cricket. Uh so you have to build individual relationships with all these different players. It goes back to the A.B. De Villiers thing, right? Um, and w- this is going to be more and more important, as we've already seen with Trent Bolt, as we will see with, with uh, Dewar Brevis, as we will see with all these different players. They're going to have to be treated differently based on who they are. That's kind of how most of us do any, any anything, right? Like if you if you treat someone as one size fits all, 
people have different mental health um, concerns. People have different lifestyles. People have different backgrounds. People have different roles. People have different skill sets. And I do feel that in cricket, um, and and I, I think it sort of comes from the, the Australian style of coaching, which has became the normal style of coaching, which is you do everything for the team. I don't think that's how cricket is in every in every nation. I think cricket is more of a team sport within the way that it grew in Australia for whatever reason. I think there's more of a golf slash tennis individualist side to cricket in, in other nations. And more so now that you have the ability to go freelance and do these other things, you need to be able to work with people. And I would say that from my experience, uh, coaches in cricket don't particularly like that and they don't like to have to deal with that. Um, and, and don't get me wrong, there are some very good coaches who have handled it very well. But I do believe that there is a a side to maybe the way that coaches think about cricket and, and boards themselves um, where, you know, there are some boards who probably think plays are replaceable. And I remember having a fight with someone on, on uh, West Indies radio about Nicholas Puran. And he was saying, and this guy was saying, wow, Nicholas, because I was saying that Nicholas Puran was a wasted talent for the West Indies in the first part of his career because one cricket board decided that he wasn't worth it and that they would look for the next most talented young player to come through after he had his accident. And this person would say, well, he had a car accident and, uh, you know, didn't look after himself. He was suggesting Nicholas Puran was in the wrong, which I have no idea if that's true. I've certainly never read that before. It is possible, of course. Um, uh, but regardless of that, Nicholas Puran was, what, 19 when he had his car accident? Was he arrogant? Most probably, although I've never come across him as arrogant, but I've only known him after the accident and having to build his career back up. But was he arrogant at that point? Was he self-entitled? I'm sure. He was 19. He was the next big star in West Indies cricket at that point. All of his friends were famous cricketers. Um, there's only going to be one Nicholas Puran. So you could sit there and go, he's done the wrong thing. He's not mature. He wants to play for himself. Um, he wants special treatment that another player doesn't isn't going to get. And if it was another Trinidad and Tobago player, they would never have got the treatment that Puran got. That's all fine. But were West Indies willing to lose out on what is now probably you know their most skilled um, modern day batter, right? And there was every chance that Nicholas Puran never went back. We've seen. You know, if you look in the NBA, uh, uh, Stephen Adams, the New Zealand player, because of how he was treated as a junior within New Zealand, doesn't represent New Zealand basketball, right? We're going to see situations like that in cricket, and the West Indies has already shown us a bunch of them, right, where players are like, I don't want to play for that board. That board didn't show me any respect. They didn't treat me the way that I thought that I needed to be treated. Um, and and that's essentially what happened with Puran and, and TNT. So um, – the way you treat players is incredibly important. And I do think that um, I, I certainly think that in cricket, we haven't quite come around to it. But the one thing I would add to all that, um, Prashant, is that we're really actually quite new to coaching. And we're also quite new to this franchise world, this the player. I mean, in, in the NBA and I suppose in, in football, it's sort of the player empowerment movement, right? We're not used to the players having power. In cricket, the players never had any power. In the old days, if you if you pissed off the cricket board and they never wanted to pick you again, other than, you know, Vinod Cambly or Dean Jones style, right? They just didn't pick you. And it, it was a it was a it was a big deal if you kept making domestic runs, but people weren't really there watching it or whatever. They could, couldn't really embarrass um, the, the national board. The national board just moved on and you had no other employment option. That's not the case anymore. And I don't think cricket has quite got around to that. And I don't think it will for 10 or 15 years because this next 10 or 15 years, <laughs> player empowerment, owner empowerment, all those sorts of things, league empowerment, uh, you know, what will, then, what will nation by nation cricket become? Uh, so the whole thing's going to be really, really interesting. And so then how you get the most out of your talent will be building relationships with players. So you might get more coaches who are, picked as national team coaches because they're brilliant at building relationships with players rather than being great technical coaches or great strategic coaches. Uh, uh, Will says, what's your opinion on Livingston being picked for the test tour of Pakistan? Can he be an all format player for England or is it a poor pick? I, look, I haven't looked at Liam Livingston's uh, test uh, first class stats. My last time I looked at them, I didn't think that he was an automatic test player. Having said that, for Basball, perhaps he is. Not really sure where he fits into that team as well. Um, 
Although I suppose if you're going to try someone in test cricket at the moment, taking them to the Pakistan pitches uh, as a batter is probably about the best, uh, <laughs> the best option you could have. My general thought on this, Will, is always the same, that it is very hard to be consistently good in red ball cricket if you have not been consistently good at domestic red ball cricket at, in the first place. That's not to say that there aren't outliers, but even those outliers generally end up with averages in the low 40s, uh, not mid 40s, certainly not high 40s or 50s. Um, so that would be my first issue. My second issue is where does he actually fit into that England lineup? Because I would have thought most of the spots where you would want him to bat, they have people, unless it's literally he comes in for Bairstow, but... I would have thought that Harry Brook, who does have a better Red Bull game and is more developed, um, uh, would be the better option there anyway. But is he a backup for someone else? I, I don't know. Um, I don't really know how he fits into that whole thinking. Um, but yes, I I have concerns, but I'd have to do a really deep dive into his numbers. But top of my head, um, I would have thought that he's, especially how hard it is to play in test cricket at the moment, unless he gets a couple of those flat Dukes, COVID pulls, um, or some really good pitches in Pakistan, I think he's going to struggle to make runs consistently in test cricket based on everything I know about him. Uh, he's an incredible talent, um, uh, but uh, I don't see that as as the best bet. But, you know, it is the continuance, I suppose, of the baseball theory. Thomas says, I really enjoyed the discussions on synthetic pitches with Barrett and the fact there's not a standard for them. Uh, I think I, well, they're not synthetic, they're hybrid pitches. <laughs> um, uh, although there's probably not a um, standard for synthetic pitches as well. Uh, given that the hybrid pitch will never be the same as grass, what would you like the standard for it to be? Um, yeah, so so the very you know the very basic part is a hybrid pitch means you are, I suppose for want of a better term, you are sowing artificial um, turf into real turf so that the pitch stays good for longer and can be used for more games, so it doesn't degrade. Um, so that it can be played on uh, in worse weather conditions, you know, wet and, and damp weather conditions, uh, and eventually get to the point where it is a more of a um, uh, consistent um, surface in T20 cricket. So both teams, um, ha or, and one day cricket. So both teams have the ability to, um, uh, you know, get the best out of the wicket and then it doesn't change massively from the beginning of the game to the end of the game. Not the end, you know, not the biggest problem, but it certainly does happen in some of those games. Uh, the problem is, I think what me and Barrett were talking about is, are eight strands of synthetic, um, you know, binding, does that make something synthetic? You know, what percentage of it uh, is actually synthetic? And at what point is, uh, oh, sorry, hybrid, now I'm going to your words, but yeah, at what point does it become a synthetic pitch and not a hybrid pitch? All right. Um, and a lot of the details about these hybrid pitches hasn't been released yet. So you could play on a hybrid pitch in, in one area and it might just be that there's a couple of threads running through the middle of it to hold it together a little bit better. And there'll be another wicket that's almost entirely synthetic with just a little bit of real grasp. And, we just need to know, are there gradations? Are there difference? What's been tested? And they really haven't done many tests. It's proper cricket here. There are different hybrid wickets all around the world. Um, there are hybrid wickets that are definitely synthetic wickets from my eyes. Like you can see that it looks synthetic. Um, and there are other wickets where it, it's fine. The other thing is just, we do we have ball tracking on these wickets? And I don't believe we have that. And until we have ball tracking tests on them, we're not going to know what their strengths are or the, what their weaknesses are. So bringing them into international cricket seems uh, very early. For your question is, should should these pitches do something similar to a local pitch? Well, they still will be local pitches. That's the thing. Because they are a hybrid, as long as the majority of the surface is um, a local pitch, if it's in Guyana, it should be low and slow um and, and turn um and if it's a hybrid pitch in the whacker it should well not the whacker anymore but in, in per stadium um it should be still getting through at a decent pace and, and very good carry um because they, they're still the pitch there here's the thing though how can we match that with the synthetic so i would think that on those sorts of extreme pitches it'd be very hard to match the synthetic parts of the pitch with the um uh, natural parts of the pitch so that creates a problem, and that's already the problem I've heard from the hybrid pitches is when the ball hits the 
the stringy bits, so the, the synthetic bits, it, it reacts completely differently than when it hits the pitch. Again, that's why we need to do tests. Can we have different kinds of hybrid surfaces built for a spinning area or a, a low area and everything else? You you know, for anyone who's ever played on synthetic wickets, like a, uh, they can be quite bouncy, right? Uh, you know, um, you don't really want to go into a test in, in Sri Lanka where the ball's ragging sideways um, when it hits one part of the pitch and skidding through when it hits another. Um, uh, you know, we saw that with the, in that test in, was it in Chennai or Ahmedabad. I can't remember which one it was. When the, when the pink balls reacted very differently depending on, uh, on, on, the, on that surface, um, how hard it was for batters to play. It's just little things like that. We should, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with these wickets because a hybrid pitch should mean we have better tournament play. Uh, so for franchise cricket and for World Cups uh, and for Olympics, Commonwealth Games, Asia Cups, any of those sorts of things, um, allows you to play lots of games in one city rather than having to travel everywhere. So that's good for carbon footprint. It's good for building an environment. It, you know, I mean, some of the problems with some of the World Cups at the moment is you, you, you have a World Cup in one city, but that city gets like three days of games and then it moves on. If you can build it up for a whole a whole month, you know, cities can start to bid for, for hosting rights for these events, which is... I think a better um, system, or you can have two or three cities and, and, and without wearing out the wickets, all these sorts of things. It should help for women's cricket. It should help for associates cricket. It's a great idea, but at a certain point, we need to know what this is, how much it has tested and who's paying to develop it. And at the moment, it feels like the people who are developing it and, and pushing it through are the ones who are making money off it. It's not to say I don't trust the people who make hybrid pitches. It's just that the set, <laughs> It's the same problem again and again. If you look at <coughs> DRS is the perfect example of the stupidest thing happening, which in some ways has massively improved and changed our sport. But we didn't actually check what DRS was until after we brought it in. By that, I mean scientifically. We brought it in because it was a bunch of TV gimmicks. Some of them worked, some of them didn't. We tested it after it was already being used in international cricket. That's not how you do things. You test it first. If you want these hybrid pitches to be um, used around the world, don't just use them in England, which is where I believe the majority of the tests are. Try them in Asia. Try them in the West Indies. Pay for this research to be done. And because of how cricket is run, we don't do any of those things. And then suddenly the ICC says, oh, well, let's just use them and we'll get more information once we start using them. And the ICC's basic premise is it should help more than it hinders. I think that's true. And on top of that, um, we already have a lot of bad pitches in the world. So are these going to be worse than the current ones we have? Well, I hope not, <laughs> but what if they are? And, and, that's, and that's the issue um, with basically the way that cricket is always wrong. Uh, Christopher says, would it be possible to have a quick DRS system of why? It's not decided by captains. It's just not reviewed, you mean, uh, but can be checked by the third umpire. Yeah, I think I wrote about this or spoke about this. It might have been in, I did something on uh, the future of cricket recently. Uh, so it was a video I did um, about the you know the 2030 World Cup. Yes, look, I don't know how high levels this has been discussed, but it's certainly been discussed by a few franchises and probably by the ICC directly. I would assume as well. Um, it's getting a bit silly now that you know we get a replay. The the best way of being able to tell this, Christopher, is it's all about how silly things look on TV. Right. So it doesn't matter if it's goal line technology or, you know, the tennis or whatever it may be. If you have a goal in football that is disallowed, right, it looks stupid on TV that two seconds later we can show, oh, that should have been allowed, um, that goal. And we've made a mistake. Right. And wides is probably the one at the moment where it's just like, I was calling a game for talk sport the other day, Ireland, South Africa. And on, on, on first view, I think I said, oh, almost a wide there, but he's just got that inside the line. And it was very close. But the minute you saw the replay, it's quite clearly a white. Um, it, it wasn't massively. It wasn't like a foot outside or whatever, but it was half an inch to an inch. And when it was super slowed down, it was hard to argue with that. Um, uh, I think at the moment, the way that DRS slash third umpire, whatever you want to call it, the, the whole off-field umpiring system is done, I think it would be un, un, they'd be unable to do it. If they would do what people like me and Adam Collins have been saying for a long time, which is have a bunker somewhere, have a bunch of experts watching the, the stuff. One expert watches the back foot straight away and another one watches uh, for wides. Or, you know, and anytime it's close, you go back to the, the main third umpire 
when they make the actual decision. But when it is close, it should be looked at straight away. Um, I believe that that is possible, and that it. Uh, but but I, from a technology point of view, I don't think it's quite as easy as the back foot no ball. Um, but having said that, sorry, back foot no ball, the front foot no ball. Um, but yes, I would say that is certainly something. Um, I think it's something that will happen. When it happens, I don't know. And a lot of it is because we're still not doing the third umpire slash DRS stuff correctly. Surf says, uh, tell us about the Monkey Gate saga that changed your career. Uh, yeah, so uh, I started my blog in 2007, Cricket with Balls. I wrote about it for, uh, I, I, I think I came on just at the end of that World Cup, the World T20, first World T20. Um, and I, to be fair, my blog was pretty big from day one. And I covered a lot of that India Australia series, um, even beforehand. You know, went to the warm up games and covered Victoria, um, India, and, and and those sorts of things. And and then the Sydney Test happened, and I think I don't know where. I think I was homeless at the time, and I was couch surfing. Uh, I was staying between a couple of friends' houses, and like I think I was spending like one or two days a week uh, at my parents' place, and then just bouncing around. Um, cause I was about to move into a house, um, and I could, we couldn't get the, uh, the agreement through quick enough. And I remember getting text message by a friend going, you've got, you've got to write about this. And I, I did watch it live, but I think I watched it live and then I had to travel uh, two or three hours straight afterwards. And then when I went back to my blog, my blog had started blowing up even before it had happened. And it meant that I didn't react to it straight away. And I think that was just the first thing that was in my favor. It allowed me to read all the stuff that was written by the Indian press and all the stuff that was written by the um, English, pre uh, English press, Australian press. And it was so clear cut how they had both just separated on nationalities. And I think as much as anything, I wanted to make fun of the whole thing because the whole thing was so stupid, right? The way that people reacted to it. Uh, the national, the nationalism side of it, the fact that Anul Kumble had got into a deal. Do you remember? Because a lot of it came from, you know, the, the, that whole test. It wasn't just that incident. It was, you know, the Brad Hogg thing that followed when he called someone a bastard. Was it Angulia bastard? I can't remember. <laughs> called someone a bastard. Um, you had the low catches. You had Ishant Sharma coming out with the same glove twice. You had the Steve Buckner. And it just separated so beautifully on that. And I suppose that even though I was Australian, I had already started to write from a more independent style thing of not looking at it from my team's perspective, which, you know, is it ended up being my career, right? But I didn't really know any of that at that stage. So I made fun of everyone and it was making fun. There wasn't any proper analysis that I remember. It was literally just making fun of every side of both parts of the press, um, of the overreactions, of the nonsense, of, you know, of, of even of Sachin's, you know uh his his um uh comments eventually or or or, or um not comments but his testimony you know of the of the you know Harvajan Singh trying to get out but it was all that whole thing and I think my blog was already on the upward curve uh but it just went from oh this guy's interesting you know I'll go over and read him once a week to people just started coming every day um and I went from I don't know probably 200 readers a day to close to a thousand readers a day within a week. And that didn't stop. And that never dipped back down that number. So most of the people who came over, even if, and, and this is kind of before things went viral because of social media. So people made me their homepage and it meant that I kept going. And then from that test, so when was that? January, um, 2008 by, July 2008, I was working in the UK as a cricket writer. It moved that quickly so that everyone went and, you know, I went to, I don't, I don't know what I was by the end of 2008 or 2009 might've been my, the big year on the blog. Um, but, you know, you were getting up towards 20, 30, 40,000 people reading. And that's, that's not a normal thing. The cricketer, you know, um, that I was writing for and were paying me had less, way less readers than I did right? Um, and it was a huge amount of numbers. And it all came off that original thing of taking the piss, being independent and talking about the crickets, not, uh, not anything else. And um, that definitely, it, it just did change my career. There's no, 
I, I would like to have thought that. No, well, I mean, I built on that, but I certainly wouldn't have been in the UK in 2008 had it not been for that little period. I went from being just another cricket blog uh, to probably being the world's biggest cricket blog. I think Will Luke had signed with Crick Info at that time. Um, and so his, you know, he wasn't really writing much on the corridor. Um, there was a couple of other really good cricket blogs out there. You know, King, there was a couple in the UK, a couple in, in India, uh, a couple in Pakistan. I think I just shooted past all of them. Um, and, you know, when I came to the UK, people didn't really know what a blog was, but they did know that a lot of people were reading my stuff. Um, and, you know, a lot of players were reading it. Uh, you know, I was sort of very much the flavor of the month for probably about 18 months um, as this, you know, random outsider. And uh, that all died down a little bit as blogs died down and I had to go and get a real job. You know, my thought was uh, that I'd seen some of the American guys, like I forget the name of, uh, of the writer, uh, but he had a blog called Free Darko. I'd watched what he had done in basketball. Uh, and I was thinking at that stage, a cricket or balls would be the business. But once the market fell out of blogs, I had to go and get work um, elsewhere. And I'd already started freelancing elsewhere, of course, by that point. But uh, by 2009, there just wasn't any money in blogging anymore to be able to do that. Um, and so I had to go. But all that, we can talk about, uh, you can talk about me being skillful and, you know, uh, me working hard. And I did. I was writing four blogs a day uh, quite often. Realistically, so much of that was made easier by skipping a, a level uh, because of what happened with that stupid test, that whole series, in fact. Um, and if, you know, you probably saw similar things with some of the social media accounts um, around the Australia India series of um, th this last one. Uh, and there's something about Indian cricket in Australia and the time zones that actually work very well for online as well. So it's not just because it doesn't work as well in India. Because if you think about it, because the games are earlier, there's more time for people to read throughout the night. Um, and, you know, the, it, it's not like they're waiting for the newspapers to come out the next morning. They kind of have to go online. It just works in a completely different way um, it, it, for that India and, and Pakistan as well, to be fair, that, that, that those sort of time zones um, and uh, right person, right place, right time. Um, and that certainly gave my career a turbo boost um back then which allowed me to sort of turn that into a career when i wasn't even trying to really do that james says have you ever drafted a piece or been asked to write a piece and canned it refused it because you felt it was unethical or distasteful distasteful certainly hundreds of times um or likely to damage your relationships within the sport <laughs> i wish the last one generally i publish them uh regardless of that um uh, uh have i ever been asked to write a piece that I didn't write because it was unethical. Unethical? Ooh. I remember, this is a really weird aside, but years ago when I met the actress Catherine Keener, it's a story for another time, uh, I, um, I was in a situation where I, um, it's the best way of putting it, uh, I was at a, a Q&A with Spike Jones. Uh, you know, just in the audience. I don't know Spike Jones. <laughs> um, and uh, we were, you know, people were asking questions and someone asked him, does it get easier when you get bigger? And, you know, because people oh, people know who Spike Jones is now. And he said, in some ways it gets harder because what happens is everyone who's seen your movies has an idea in their head what a Spike Jones movie is. And I certainly, in fact, the Krieger Balls thing was the toughest with that. Because uh, you would get people coming to you and being like, oh, I want you to write this Cricket with Balls piece. But, of course, you can't really write a Cricket with Balls piece unless you're on Cricket with Balls to start with. And their idea of a Cricket with Balls piece was not what a Cricket with Balls piece was anyway. Um, so I got a lot of articles that were – that I was asked to write where I was just like, this is stupid. You know, oh, can you make fun of, I don't know, Sachin Tendulkar? Well, not really. That's not how. That's not how this works. That's not what this is that I do. Um, so there were certainly a lot of things uh, like that. I can't think of anything unethical, um, although I'm sure there has been, but nothing really distasteful is the one I'm sort of talking about there, um, where there have um, certainly been times um, where I wrote things. Sorry, I was asked to write things where I was just like, 
is a bit maybe because I was there at the early days of clickbait before we even had a term for it. There's a lot of clickbaity stuff I was asked to write. I've occasionally just been asked to write things that just aren't me. Um, and I, you know, I either take the job and just rewrite it the way I want, or I just don't do it. Um, likely to damage your relationships within the sport. Look, there's something within me as a personality um, that I just, uh, I don't worry about that sort of stuff. Sadly, I should. For instance, I think I was the first person who wrote a really big review on um, uh, Cricket Writers on TV, the Sky program. And look, there were parts of that program that I really liked and I thought I put that across, but there was also parts of the program that were clearly not very good and it wasn't a, as good a TV show as it should have been. Um, uh, Alec wasn't the ideal host, but it was his idea to be fair to him, so good on him for having the idea. Uh, there are a lot of people talking about things that they weren't experts on on that show. Uh, the format didn't particularly work. It wasn't like the football one, which is obviously where it, it had been um, uh, originally seen. And, you know, so I wrote a big piece talking about it. Well, you know, um, I was never, I, I think I'm the only cricket writer who's been in the UK for a long period of time who never got asked on it. <laughs> that, I'm not saying it ruined my career, probably ruined me making an easy 500 quid one morning, but um, it's not ideal to be in a situation where you can't be on Sky. In fact, I've never been on Sky for anything at any stage. Um, and I've written a few pieces that have talked about the free-to-air stuff and that annoyed Sky as well. Um, BBC uh, wrote about their ridiculous war with Test Match Sofa. Again, you know, you can imagine that didn't really help people. Uh, written about players and coaches um, that haven't gone down well. There's, there's a particular team recently who uh, wanted me to work for them and someone higher up remembered an article I wrote 12 years ago um that was negative about that person and was just like he's never going to work for us in any capacity ever again um so i mean in that case i probably do that more and more um look you it's hard with sources um so there are probably things that maybe i've known with sources where just like okay so i can write this piece and you know, it's newsworthy and maybe it should be out there, although I don't write news specifically, but, you know, it's worthy of being written. Um, will it affect that source? I usually tell them beforehand and sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. Uh, not being a news writer, though, it is a little bit different for me and I can catch things in different ways. Um, but, I, you know, I try and get to the truth of what I'm writing and do the work. And some people aren't going to like that. So from that perspective, no, I don't think I, there's only one piece I wrote with Crick Info that was canned and they asked me to write it. I wrote it. And then they thought that that would damage the relationship with people inside of cricket and they didn't do it. I felt a little bit ripped off that I'd spent all my time working on it. Um, but yeah, I don't think there was, um, I, I, I can't think of that many times where I've said, I'm not going to do that piece. Um, I think I've changed a lot as a writer. So there are probably pieces that I was offered later on in my career that I didn't write because I, you know, early on in my career, I'd already done them and felt that they were either not very good or that I wasn't that interested in them. Um, and he's also asked about the Red Kings. Red Kings were the balls. Uh, they were made by Kookaburra uh, that we used in junior cricket, but there was another ball um, that, that that some of them had as well. All right. Well, that was, I don't know how I went on that long there or, or I started late earlier. I can't remember. Uh, Nikhil was first. Nikhil, you there? Nikhil? Oh, hey, Janet, can you hear me? Sorry. I've, I've got gotcha. you. Hey, What's your question, mate? Hey, Janet. So, uh, uh, firstly, and up the uh, likely longer session that you had today on the, I think it was the Patreon uh, questions, very interesting questions asked and very well answered, Janet. Uh, just one thing, I've just observed it. Are we seeing... Uh, sort of a diminishing trend of all format players. I can't seem to recollect too many players who are really all format stars. I mean, who really play all formats really, really well. I feel. I think Kohli was one of the last ones. Mitchell Stark was one of the all format specialists for a short period of, period of time. But, you know, Kohli is probably struggling to balance the three formats currently. Stokes, the same issue. Uh, Stark, you know, he's falling off a little bit in the T20s. Barber, to be honest, I mean, uh, he's never really 
he never had any, you know, strikes feared and he was a T20 player. Rizwan doesn't do well in ODIs or tests. Uh, I'm just trying to figure out, is it because of IFA specialization of cricket today with data and with real specialized skills and obviously the cricket calendar being so cramped up that it's just getting impossible for players, you know, after playing for three or four years to be equally good in all formats. I mean, KL Rahul is another example of that, right? You just see him sometimes yeah. just moonwalking through uh, or jaywalking through a T20 innings because just the context switching, is it getting harder? Uh, I think the schedule is maybe one of the biggest things. So it's, as you said, it's so cramped. So it's actually physically hard to play all three formats, right? Even if you are good enough, you know, uh, to be able to do it. So Joe Root, there's absolutely no doubt he's good enough to play all three formats, right? But it's really hard for him to actually fit in the time to 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 prove it. Like if he wanted to play at the IPL, he'd probably have to go and play in the Big Bash or the um, PSL for a couple of years um, and play some games for England. But England wouldn't allow that to happen and so he's not going to be able to do it he you know he's obviously skillful enough to do that josh hazelwood's a really interesting one because josh hazelwood suddenly became an all-format player of recent times but yeah i think it's a combination of that i do think there's a little bit of hyper specialization so uh there are you know there are certainly there are certainly problems within that but i think mostly it's to do with the fact that it's really if you're playing against someone who spends even if they're not as good a cricketer as you, if they spend 12 months of the year preparing for this format and you literally have picked up a white ball a week ago and are playing against them, I don't think you can be a consistently good player. And, you know, the, Mitchell Stark is the one I would go to. We know we know that for a long time, Mitchell Stark was the best white ball bowler uh, in the world, right? And as you said, of recent times, we're not seeing that at all. Now, maybe He's just not bowling as well in general. I know he changed the way he was bowling in test cricket. Maybe that's affected um, him in, 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 in one day cricket and T20 cricket. I don't know. But it does feel that he's going up against people who are experts in what they're doing. And he's hoping that his overall skills will be enough to make him survive. And from what we have seen, that doesn't seem to be as easy as it was before. So, so certainly I think the cramping of the schedule is probably the first one. And then on top of that, maybe it is the rise of sort of hyper specialization. Thanks, Jared. No worries. Cheers, mate. Kyle, you there? Hi, Jared. Hey, mate. What's your question? Uh, I saw this question a couple of nights ago and I watched your Ireland Scotland preview. Um, great work, by the way. A fan like me really uses that to contextualize what he's watching. Um, this might be a dumb question, but you use the term hitting off the square a bit. Uh, and I was wondering, <laughs> and on that, because for context, I know. I have an idea of what it means, but I was wondering if you can expand on what it means practically and why some batters might struggle with it or what to watch for. Yeah, so that's, it's, um, it's the sort of thing that you kind of know more about if you've played cricket. And it's one of those phrases that I use that, uh, I remember once talking to the sports editor of The Guardian and, and he said, um, you know, the reason we don't use you is because you use all this um, uh, phraseology that only cricket, uh, cricket nuffies know about. And that's probably what he was talking about. So if you if you um, do a Google image search of the Oval is one of the best ones at this, but any sort of test venue and you do a Google image search over the top uh, or um, whatever you call it, uh, uh, I forget the name of it. You know what I'm talking about. Uh, you'll see that pitches actually form a square uh, on, on, on the turf. And so um, you've usually got most professional grounds probably have around minimum of eight uh, pitches. Uh, and then somewhere like the oval, you can actually see, the reason I say the oval is you can see the strip goes almost from one side of the square to the other. So they have usable pitches right across the middle of the ground. Uh, and we call it the square. It's never actually a square, Kyle. It's, you know, usually probably um, a rectangle of, of some form, but we call it a square in, in cricket. And what we're really talking about then is, it really it almost comes back to uh, junior cricket as much as anything. There are people who have the the power to be able to hit the ball um, off off the field, um, and there are people who can only poke the ball. And so when we say hitting off the square, we're really we're really the, the difference between someone who can hit regular boundaries by muscling the ball um, and by someone who can't. So any almost anyone can time the ball, right? 
uh, but hitting off the square is more of uh, the strength of that player. So you, when you when you play, you see a lot of junior cricketers play in senior cricket. You can tell straight away that they've got the right footwork, they get in the right position, they're reading the bowlers correctly, and all this sort of stuff. But they'll play, you know, the most aggressive shot that they can, and the ball will dribble um, to mid off, right? And mid off is right on the edge of the square, right? Um, and point is right on the edge of the square, and mid wicket might be on the edge of the square. So you would actually, the best way of putting it these days would be, you know, can they clear the inner ring? which would be a much more modern way of saying it. But if you grew, grew up playing when I did or you played club cricket, we often don't have rings. <laughs> so we probably still use the phrase hitting it off the square. Um, but that's essentially what it means. It's just talking about the, the strips where the pitches are and you're talking about the strength of a player rather than the timing um, or the skill of a player. Oh, okay. I, I was thinking it was like how the ball came off the bat and like square meaning like the angle of... So yeah, I'm glad I asked because that is not what I uh, was. Just- no, it's way less technical than that. It's way. It really is. So if you look at, I think uh, which which team did I use it for? Was that? Um, uh, I think it was it was Ireland. They said you know they had they struggle with players who can off the square. I think if they do, I might have been. I think I wrote it for Sri Lanka as well. So if you look at Sri Lanka, you, they've got a lot of players who could score boundaries, right? But those players who could score boundaries, uh, if you have a look at their overall strike rates, they still have a low strike rate. And so in order for those players to score boundaries, they almost have to hit it perfectly off, off the middle of the bat, right? So I'm doing something on Lance Klusner at the moment. So Lance Klusner was a South African cricketer from the late 90s, early 2000s, uh, whose nickname was Zulu. And he was just a big, strong guy, um, you know, Probably, you know, since you're an American, he looks like a, a tight end type of, uh, of, of, I mean, is tight end the right? Yeah, I think tight end. That, do you know what I mean? You know, stocky, athletic um, uh, sort of guy who could run through a brick wall sort of um, uh, person, but still quite athletic uh, w- within that. Um, and that's what Klusner looked like. And he basically pioneered uh, range hitting. And cre- he pioneered a bunch of things because he was a, a completely different kind of player. He had the ability to miss hit a ball and still get a four or a six for in the same way that modern, uh, you know, West Indian players. And now we're seeing a lot of modern T20 players over the last five or six years have that ability. If you look at the Sri Lankan team, a lot of their players um, really don't have that ability to hit a boundary unless they're hitting the ball out at the absolute middle of the screws or they're slashing at the ball. So, so when we're talking about hitting off the square, we're usually talking about hitting in front of square. Right? It's very easy to use the pace of a fast bowler and hit to behind square on the leg side or the offside, right? And score a boundary, if, even if you're a kid playing in senior cricket. The really hard one is, and this is when you need a certain amount of strength, is to hit a, a 90 mile an hour bowler back past themselves, right? So there's this great story. I can't remember where I read this, but I read this years ago about this, uh, this club cricketer who for years dined out on the fact that I think he made 100 against Joel Garner or Wayne Daniels, one of the fast West Indian bowlers. And he dined out about this. And when someone went and did a, you know, talk to all the players about this guy, you know, to do like his 40th birthday treat, they worked out that he didn't hit a single ball in front of square, right? Because he didn't have the power to hit a fast bowler back past them, right? But what he could do is help the, the ball on its way and use that speed. Um, and so when we're talking about hitting off the square, that's what we're really talking about. So uh, with, uh, you might be right, maybe I can't remember saying it about Ireland or, or Scotland. Scotland have actually quite a few power players, but I do, I, I can remember maybe saying it about Sri Lanka where you do look at some of the players and you worry if they, you worry if they have the ability to consistently, and when we're talking about hitting off the square now, we're not talking about literally the square. We're really talking about, do you have the ability to muscle a ball over mid off or uh, sorry, over long on or long off, right? So the ball's a little bit old. People are taking the pace off it. You've got two fielders out straight, maybe one at deep mid wicket as well. Do you have the ability to to beat those players? And uh, there are, you know, a lot of players around the world that do, but there are a lot of players around the world who still don't. And their only hope of beating long on or long off con- consistently is timing the ball absolutely perfectly and getting their weight and everything through the ball. That's a hard thing to do in T20 when you're trying to manufacture boundaries, right? The the perfect ball doesn't come to you very often in T20 cricket because you know it it you know the sort of deliveries that are being bowled to you are uh, they're trying to spoil that right? So you have to be able to manufacture it by moving around in your crease, getting into st- slightly weird physical um, um, uh, areas at certain times to play those sorts of shots. So when I, I am talking about that, I'm really talking about the difference of someone who can hit boundaries and someone who strikes boundaries. 
So someone with the, who's a natural striker of the ball will, you know, you can see those players. Um, I'm trying to think of someone, Kyle. That we, so, so Kane Williamson, right? If you look at Kane Williamson, everything comes from the timing that he plays, right? And if you compare him to Andre Russell, everything comes from the power. And those are the two different kinds of uh, uh, players that we have in world cricket. Uh, and you, if you're Kane Williamson, you still have enough skills that you can score boundaries in other ways. And then once you get your eye in, you'll be able to middle enough balls that you'll be able to get them. Because you're Andre Russell, it's really more about getting into a power position and swinging through the line as much as possible. And even if you only get 70% contact, 70% contact might give you 70 meters. Um, and that's enough to get it over the head of, uh, you know, Marco Janssen at long on. Yeah, I appreciate that. I always think of sports uh, and players in terms of spectrum. So that that's one way of think way of thinking of it. Uh, thanks again, and uh, I really appreciate the World Cup uh, coverage. No worries, man. Uh, we're doing uh, we're doing heaps of stuff on the World Cups so on the YouTube. We should have something every day, and I'll try and get uh, plenty of writing out there as well on the email uh, where I can. Um, oh, sorry, someone is just. Let me see who's next. Uh, Nikhil, you can come back. There's no line, man. It just it just comes up with names. So Nikhil, if you want to ask, um, he can't see you there. Yeah. Hey. Hey, mate. What's your question? Uh, it's about the uh, best team wins theory. You know, the, uh, mm -hmm. it's used generally uh, almost to a point of clean sheet tests in ODIs, uh, but in T20s, the uh, T20s are inherently closer to uh, you know a 50-50 chance for each team to win right off the bat. Well, uh, and you know, if there is that any team can win on their day, uh, thing, you know, which is more pronounced in D20s than on its ODIs. Mm -hmm. Uh, but still, we, we haven't really gotten a team that's cracked it throughout. They, uh, of course, England and West Indies have come really close, uh, in World Cups, and uh, maybe Mumbai Indians in Sanchez Brigade. Maybe there are other two, uh, teams too. I don't know about them, uh, but yeah. Do you see uh, that closing down as we get a little more literate? In, where, where do you think we are in that uh, spectrum? Well, basically, the best team wins is a nonsense concept anyway, because if the best teams all, always won, we'd never have any upsets, right? And we also, we'd all be rich from betting on the best teams. Um, so it's even if you can, you can lose a game in which you've actually outplayed the opposition. That is very possible within almost any sport at any time. Um, oh, oh, the difference within T20 uh, is is that I, I suppose the the best teams can win uh, test matches around what seventy to seventy five, maybe eighty percent of the time, or not lose if you count the West Indies um, run within that. Um, one day cricket, you're probably looking more 70 to 75 and T20 cricket, you're looking more 60 to 65. So the longer the game, if we played test cricket, um, on, on, uh, in timeless games, uh, I would think that in general that would go up again the best teams would win even, you know, probably slightly more of the time. Um, and then in one day cricket, that obviously comes down and T20 cricket that comes down again, uh, that's part of the allure, I think, of T20 cricket. Uh, there is a bit more randomness in the results. Even if people maybe intellectually aren't sitting there thinking that is the case, um, there are going to be more upsets. It's, uh, you know, and you, there is going to be more randomness within the results. We might get to a point where eventually when, I don't know, let's say the IPL is 30 games a season, um, where there, there'll be easier to draw a form line through that, right, and, and really work out, uh, what that means and, and everything else. But uh, who was it? Was it Gujarat? I can't remember. Whichever one of the new teams was last year had an extraordinary amount. Were they the ones that had all the close games? Lucknow. Yeah, so Lucknow, right? Um, uh, those games are coin toss, <laughs> right? Like there's no way in, in professional sports over a five-year period you could ever win that many close, that high percentage of close games right? Um, it's always going to regress back to the mean. The teams who are going to win consistently in, uh, in any, any league or format like that are going to be the teams who win by large amounts, not by teams who win by small amounts. Um, and, and, you know, and look, there, there's two perfect examples, I think, in the basketball over the last couple of years of teams who have gone really well 
um, because the opposition teams, even over an 82 game season in basketball, have shot really poor, poorly against them from three point line. Um, New York Knicks and Miami Heat last year. When the New York Knicks did it, they, they thought the team was so good that they invested in all their team. And then it turned out their team wasn't very good. And the next year, they were absolutely shit, right? There is a, a certain amount of luck in anything uh, from, from Gujarat winning the last IPL, Australia winning um, uh, the last World Cup. There's a lot of randomness in it. And I don't think we're ever going to get to a particular point where it's going to be that, that we're, we're going to be able to take the randomness out. The way you take the randomness out is basically, it, you always, I, I think the perfect example of this is the Ireland-England test years ago when um, the first test at Lords, when England were bowled out for you know nothing in the first innings, right? And they were able to work their way back into the game. And we've seen lots of test teams be able to do that. It's almost impossible in T20. So if something does happen, do you remember the Angelo Matthews over um, against the West Indies in the 2009 World Cup where he took, what was it? Felt like eight wickets in the first over. Um, I don't. I mean, Chris Gale plays a brilliant innings after that. There's just nothing he could do. Too much damage was done too early on in that game to be able to overcome it. And whereas if you take three or four wickets in the first over of a test match, you're much more likely to still go on to win the test than you are in T20 cricket. And, you know, so little events in T20 cricket have a huge impact Whereas, you know, you can, in a test match, you can be what? Eight for 120 and still make 450, right? You, you could still bat the opposition out of the game from eight for 120 or 120 for eight, sorry. Um, went all Australian there. Um, and uh, so I do think there is a big, big difference between uh, the way that those things go. Um, and I don't think we can ever account for that. It's, it's actually, that's what the big bash has been trying to fix is the um they, that's what a lot of their rule changes are about trying to make it more even but once one one team's in front in t20 cricket that's kind of it um and i think that's probably one of the reasons that football and basketball are so popular is that so many of their games come down to the end because in football you only need you know if one team scores a goal in the last five minutes um that can make the game feel much closer than it is and in basketball again even if the game doesn't get as particularly as close. In the last couple of minutes, it slows down to such a, uh, an extent um, that sometimes it feels closer uh, than, than, than it particularly is, which is the whole thing of you only play, you need to play the last two minutes of a basketball game. It's not true when you look statistically. But again, with both those sports, there's an artificial closeness that you get in those two sports. T20 cricket has it, but it, it, it also has the ability for one bowler or one batter to be so impactful that the game can be over a quarter of the way through it um, in a way that probably doesn't affect some of those other sports. But that randomness means that you can be Mumbai Indians as much as you want, but some random kid you've never heard of takes four wickets in the first three overs um, and your game's pretty much over. Uh, and it doesn't matter if you're the better team from then on in. Even if you play the better cricket, for the 90% of the game, that 10% is such a big impact that you may not be able to overcome it. And I don't think that is, I don't think there's a way around that unless I'm misunderstanding uh, my reading of the sport. <laughs> yeah. I don't, uh, with, uh, when England toured Pakistan recently, uh, uh, the thing that you talked about uh, where, you know, uh, till England were, was, out, was almost out on, uh, in the first third of the game, and then they continued uh, hitting, attacking, particularly the batters. So, you know, they got through you know, close to winning. Do you think that's kind of workable in uh, the World Cup and tournaments like that? Or uh, how much of, how much randomness do you think that reduces or increases? I think that what we will work out is that unlike one-day cricket, where the best way is to consolidate and regroup, I think what we will work out in T20 cricket, that when you have that bad start, unless you think the opposition are very, very weak or you have a particularly, you know, good second unit. So, you know, if you had the bad start with the bat or the ball, whatever it is, whatever your second unit game is going to be in the second innings, you are much better off to go all out and attack and lose the game. Um, and, and, sorry, give yourself a high percentage chance of losing the game, but give yourself a much bigger chance of winning the game. Whereas a consolidation style, as, as I said, unless the conditions are in your favor or you have a particular lineup advantage in the second half of the game, 
uh, more often than not, if you're that far behind the game and you spend any of your time mucking around in order to get back on top, you're just, you're never in the game, right? Like, like if you consolidate and your best chance after consolidating is still getting to 120, 125, and it's a normal flat T20 wicket, so par is going to be around 160, 165, you're not really leaving yourself a chance to win that game. Right. Whereas if you get bowled out for 85, you're going to lose anyway. And if you somehow can get to 160, 170, even beyond that, by going all out attack, you've got a much higher percentage. I think that is probably where we will find more teams trying. Having said that, the problem with that is the embarrassment side of it, of if you do throw everything in to that early part of the game, that's kind of it. And that's, you know, cricket is a naturally conservative game. It is about conserving your wickets. Um, and so you will find teams, there, there will be teams who do that and there will be teams that don't do that, I suppose is the best way of putting it. But I, I think too often I see a team recover in T20 cricket to basically lose anyway, if that makes sense. So they've done well in the last, I don't know, 14 overs of the game. Um, but they've, rec they've done so well in the last 14 overs of the game that all they've really done is meant that the other team's going to win in, in, in 18 overs, not 14 overs. Right. Um, and so I think we know enough at the moment that at the very least, I mean, it's very early on in T20 cricket and these things might change anyway. The way that we play the game will fundamentally change. Um, I've got a video coming out on Friday about all the different changes we've already had in, in T20 cricket. Um, so I do think from that perspective, that might change. But as it's currently played, I think you're much better off to go all in attack. I mean, we, we, we know that if you lose uh, three wickets in the power play, uh, you're going to lose, uh, what is it, 66 or 70% of the time, right? So if that's the case, why are you chipping the ball around? Be the 30%, you know, aim for the 30% knowing you're probably going to be in the 70% anyway. And I don't think that's how the majority of T20 teams still think but there are a couple of teams that do that. But a lot of it also has to do with your batting lineup. So a lot of these franchise teams where at number seven is a guy who should never be at number seven in professional cricket, right? And they're using him at number seven because they know he can hit, if he faces 12 balls of fast bowling, he's likely to hit 20 runs of it in the last three overs. And now he's having to bat in, in, the, in, the, in the eighth over because you've lost a lot of wickets. Well, you're probably not going to have many people who can bat after him. And if that's the case, it's hard to go with my theory um, you, you really have to, let's say you're three wickets down, then you, you know, your number four and your number five both have to make 70 um, of 40 balls for my theory to, to work. So I'm not saying any of that is easy, but I do think that might be something that teams look at more and more into the future. No worries. Um, I better go, everyone. So uh, sorry, Nikhil, you didn't come back in. Um, so I don't know what happened there, but uh, thank you to everyone uh, for coming on and, and chatting. Uh, remember, uh, we now have Barrett's podcast. We have uh, the Wagon Wheel and we have Red Inca. And there's also Double Century out on Fridays. Uh, so we've got a great series at the moment about the history of cricket teams that were really good that never got test status. And the next one is on the Netherlands. So that should be out if you're listening to this on a podcast. And if you're listening to this live, um, it will come out tomorrow. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much, everyone. I'll talk to you again soon. Mm -hmm.